I'm thrilled about the opportunity to talk to you about swift foxes. I figure that we'll talk a little bit about their ecology. I'll introduce you to the reintroduction effort that's currently underway that we're actively implementing. And then about the research that comprises my PhD dissertation. I'll give you a taste of what we're doing and some of the early results so far. Um, but with that being said, it's important for me to acknowledge that uh, I'll probably say we a lot more than I. Um, I am on a very large team, a big collaborative effort to do this research. Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. How is this? Is that a little better? Thank you. Catch me also. If, I, if that happens again, let me know because I'm, I'm a little bit soft-spoken. <laughs> okay, well, the main thing that I wanted to say before we get started is just that um, I want to acknowledge that everything that I'm talking about today is not me alone. I'm on a pretty impressive team uh, that's collaborating to get this conservation effort underway that's being led by the Fort Belknap Indian Community and the Smithsonian Institution, but as you'll see, we have a lot of important collaborators to get this work done. So get started and make sure that everybody's on the same page. What is a swift fox? This is what it is. <laughs> you can say it's cute, that's fine. Uh, they are a very small uh, canid member of the dog family that's native to North America. And you can recognize the swift fox relative to other canids that you see in this area uh, by their coloration. They're kind of sandy brown and they've got that black tip to their tail. What's helpful for me when I look at trail camera photos is that they have these black marks on either side of their muzzle. Um, and that's different than a red fox who's gonna have a white tip to their tail, oftentimes black legs. Uh, but one of the biggest things that helps you know that you're looking at a swift fox when you see one is the fact that they're tiny. Uh, these swift foxes are one of the smallest canids in North America. Uh, they're about five pounds soaking wet. So that is about a fifth of the size of a coyote. Uh, and it's smaller than most house cats, particularly my spoiled house cat. It is much smaller than her. Uh, and so that's kind of the thing that strikes me the most when I see a swift fox and knowing how to identify it. And even after a few years of working on them, uh, it's striking just how small they are. And being that tiny, they eat appropriately tiny things. Uh, their diet is mostly made up of small mammals, things like Ground squirrels, voles, mice, rabbits make up about 40% of their diet. And then seasonally, um, insects are a pretty important diet item for these guys as well. So they're eating a whole lot of grasshoppers. It, you, you can't be mad at them. <laughs> uh, but also, being that tiny, uh, they have a lot of predators themselves. So a me is a carnivore, meaning that they consume meat, but they're also depredated upon themselves. Coyotes are one of the main sources of mortality for swift foxes, um, one of their big competitors. Although you also see them uh, occasionally taken down by a bird of prey, like a golden eagle or other type of raptor. And then in this modern day and age, they're also subjected to a decent amount of vehicle collisions, unfortunately, as some of their main sources of mortality. A couple other things about their life history. Uh, they live for about three to six years on average, or at least that's what we know. And they reproduce in their first year of life. So they've got a pretty quick life history. Um, and every time they reproduce, they have these litters of between one and six young. And um, both parents will help take care of the, the many hungry mouths, as you can see in this photo. Uh, the kids are wrestling over a prairie dog, is what's happening there, and mom is just standing back. And they raise those big old litters um, mostly underground for the first couple months of their lives. They are, the swift foxes are den dependent, um, one of the most den dependent of all the canids. So uh, when you think about their habitat requirement, one of the things is having that soil that's friable, that they can excavate burrows and spend a lot of their life below ground, including raising cute babies like that. Um, so that's one thing that you need to think about when you're thinking about swift fox habitat. Another thing to think about is that they're generally going to be in areas that are flat. Uh, they don't like a lot of topographic changes. They like flat, wide open areas. 
And then paper after paper talks about the importance of um, large tracts of short stature grasslands. So they need large amounts of space with native grasses. Um, a student in D David Jahowski's lab before I was uh, studying swift foxes found that up in Montana, they require 42 square kilometers of space for their home ranges. And for those of us who do not think in the metric system, that's about 10,000 acres for these tiny five pound animals. They need a lot of space. Now there are certainly some exceptions. Uh, where I live in Wyoming, we've got them, uh, swift foxes in about knee-high sage. And in Kansas, they're in some areas that are, that are predominantly cropland, but by and large and in the core of their range, they're needing large tracts of short grass prairie, prairie to live. And so that kind of helps explain why they're a species of concern or why they're a species in need of some conservation assistance. And so what I've got shown for you on this map here is their historic range. So where, where swift foxes have been, they're native to Western North America, and you can see that they were in the prairie provinces all the way down fairly into the panhandle of Texas. And that historic range is largely overlapping with what we know to be um, the extent of short and mixed grass prairie in Western North America. Now, unfortunately, relying on short and mixed grass prairie, uh, you can maybe think about some of the things that would have caused their decline. So as European settlement took place, a couple big things happened that weren't so great for swift foxes. One, conversion to cropland. In a lot of instances, conversion to cropland was a detriment to swift fox habitat. And then the other thing is predator eradication campaigns that were targeted towards wolves and coyotes. Unfortunately, it took out a lot of swift foxes too. They're very curious and those poison baits were not discriminating between species. So by the late 1800s, we only had about 60, or we only had about 40% of the swift foxes that we used to, according to the best estimates, and they only covered about 40% of their range. So their species of concern, uh, for a while, they were petitioned for the endangered species list. They've since been removed. Um, but this is kind of where they are today. So in green, you can see it's more than 40% of their historic range. And we're grateful for that. And a big reason why they weren't uh, listed is because they were able to naturally recolonize quite a few areas. So after those indiscriminate poisons for wolves and coyotes were banned, swift foxes did bounce back. And by the 1950s, in, especially in the southern part of their range, they really kind of bounced back in number and distribution, which is great. And then when you look at this map and you see that with those kind of funky green shapes, one of the things that might jump out to you is that there's an isolated part of their range along the Canada and Montana border. And so some of this expansion of their range after that big decline in the late 1800s is due to successful reintroduction efforts. So intentional movements of either captive bred animals or translocated animals from other parts of their range where they're healthy um, have led us to have swift foxes in Montana along that uh, Canada border. And this is due to the efforts of the Canadian government, as well as a couple of native nations, the Blackfeet tribes and the, Port, the uh, Fort Peck tribes were able to successfully reintroduce swift foxes. So that's great. They are doing better than they were. But despite that success, we do still have a gap in their range, right? And we can see if we zoom into Montana here, there is a gap um, that's about 200 miles or 350 kilometers, um, and it's generally bounded by the Milk River. So if you guys think about north of here, they were not seeing a lot of foxes um, cross that Milk River, and people think that that's a pretty solid boundary for them. And this isn't great. Uh, when we think about long-term persistence of the species, having genetically isolated populations is not ideal. So that kind of sets the stage for why a reintroduction at Fort Belknap, shown on this slide, uh, could be useful for the species both in Montana and overall. So the main goals of the reintroduction, when we think about them ecologically, as I've set the stage for you so far, it's expanding that range of the northern population. See if we can get them to move a little bit further south. That's in turn promoting connectivity in the long run. Hopefully the populations continue to expand further south and we'll see them connect. 
But given that this restoration effort is happening uh, on sovereign lands of the Ani and Nakoda nations, there's an important element to consider that's not just ecological. The cultural importance of restoring this species is also a huge motivation for the reintroduction. Um, and I would just like to point out that our neighbors at Fort Belknap have um, successfully reintroduced other species and are, in fact, leaders in conservation. Right now in Montana, the only place that you can find swift fox, black-footed ferret, and bison all in one spot is on Fort Belknap. So this is a huge source of pride and a huge achievement. Now, despite the fact that Fort Belknap has shown us that reintroductions can be successful in the area, it's still a big responsibility. Reintroductions can be viewed as risky. They don't always work the way that we want them to and uh, they can be kind of expensive or resource intensive. When the Smithsonian joined this project and started getting involved with the reintroduction, they wanted to make sure that they were checking all of the boxes to promote success as best as possible with a goal of having a long-term persistent population, having swift foxes not just for a couple years, but having them around for long enough that we can start seeing those effects of connectivity. So a few of the things that you look at, um, if you follow these big IUCN or the International Union for the Conservation of Nature guidelines, they've got a few things that they want you to look at before you get started. And we don't have to get in the weeds with all of these, but stakeholders in planning, you have a lot of meetings, a whole lot of meetings to make sure that the alphabet soup of agencies is on board, is knowing what you're doing, and that you have talked to all the appropriate management agencies. You do a risk assessment. You make sure that the reason that the species has declined in the first place, that those risks have been ameliorated. You don't want to set up these reintroduced animals for failure. And then uh, population viability analysis, basically doing some pretty intense math to figure out uh, the number of animals that you bring up, whether you do captive bred, whether you bring them from other parts of their range. That's kind of factored in and you can do some math to try to optimize your chance of these populations lasting in the long run. And then finally, habitat suitability. We can have the best of attentions and really good ideas about this working, but is there actually enough space and the resources for this animal to succeed? And so I'll show you a couple of the results from some of this um, pre-reintroduction work that was done by Smithsonian. Uh, this map is not the easiest to interpret, I'll admit, but if you look, you can see the outline of Fort Belknap in bright orange there. And the darker colors represent more suitable habitat. And what's cool about this is that in addition to measuring things like the soil that we know is important to swift foxes and the grassland cover that we know is important to swift foxes, they also looked at the presence of coyotes. So what was that coyote activity like so that they could kind of measure in a spatial measurement of where their threats were, as well as their diet items. They did measurements of rodent activity and arthropod or insect abundance to get this kind of biotic and abiotic map of where there was suitable habitat in Phillips Valley and Blaine counties. And these are the results. The results were that there was just shy of 5,300 square miles that counted as suitable habitat in those three counties. And 460 of those were within Fort Belknap boundary alone. So these measurements told us that Fort Belknap by itself could support 60 swift fox pairs. So that seemed good moved forward with that population viability analysis. And like I mentioned, um, these are basically just running some models to kind of predict how the population would do under a few different scenarios. And this helped us decide how many animals to bring up and how many years to do it. And all of these results, this is kind of where some of the stakeholders and planning part of this comes in, all of these results were presented to a two-day meeting of experts to decide, does this make sense? Um, to the people in the room from a bunch of different agencies with a bunch of different expertise levels to talk about whether this is feasible. And the communication did not stop there. Um, this is, a, <laughs> this is a, a very busy slide, but it's showing you the um, many, many different agencies that we didn't just talk to before the reintroduction started, but these are folks who join our um, quarterly 
update calls. So even as the reintroduction is progressing, we are communicating with folks from four different state agencies, a couple different federal entities. We're being advised by a few different tribes, Bureau of Indian Affairs, handful of non-governmental organizations, universities. There's a lot of people. We do a lot of talking. But each of these uh, organizations has representatives who are playing a role in a funding, advising, or management role in all of this. Presented all the results of that habitat suitability modeling, the population viability analysis, the risk assessment, all those things. We presented it to that group of people and ultimately decided to proceed. Spoiler alert, right? Like we, 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 we're doing it. Um, <laughs> uh, so there, the general plan, the consensus out of all of those meetings that, this, that we would try to move 40 to 50 foxes per year for five years, and they decided that a good idea would be to move them from states that have healthy populations already. So parts of their range where swift foxes are doing all right, we would move them, and this all started in 2020. So where we are right now is we've moved three batches of foxes and on to the next one soon. You can see there's a pretty big spatial gradient. Those ones from Colorado rode in my truck with me, and that is a 16-hour drive, if you were wondering. <laughs> but more about what this actually looks like. So that's all the planning. That's all the, like, the build-up to what we're actually doing. This is what the translocations actually look like. I'll walk you through that real quickly. So step one is catch the foxes. Uh, we set out as many live traps as we can to get them as quickly as possible. We bait them with um, bacon, sardines, and some pretty nasty scent lure, uh, and it works. We catch them up pretty quickly in most cases, and then uh, once they're captured, we take them to a central processing area where we've had the very generous help of um, state wildlife veterinarians to do the inspections of each fox that is captured to make sure that it's healthy enough for translocation um, and get a general sense of the animal's um, health before they move it. This process is stressful on us. I can only imagine how stressful it is on the foxes. So they make sure that the animal's looking good. They write the certificates. And it's at this time that we put on the GPS collars on each translocated fox that I'll tell you about mo more momentarily. Once the vets say the fox is all right, we load them into our trucks and we drive them up to Fort Belknap. And at Fort Belknap, these foxes get released into what we call soft release pens or acclimation pens. So these are small enclosures placed over a burrow uh, where the foxes can go into for five days or until they dig themselves out. Sometimes they know better than we do. Uh, but it allows them these five days that they can get a little extra food, water, before exploring their brand new home. And a good amount of work goes into getting these uh, sided and built before the foxes actually move up. And so I would just like to point out that we are grateful for the help of um, a lot of different people to get this done. In this photo are some interns with the Ani and Nakota College who have helped out with this project. And this is not their favorite thing that we do. <laughs> but it's really important. And uh, once the animals have been in those pens for five days or until they dig themselves out, um, we release them and they're allowed to explore their new home and we wish the best. But one important thing that I just want to kind of remind folks is that this isn't just an ecological project, this is a cultural project as well. And so the Anya and Dakota College students have organized release ceremonies for several of these years in which tribal elders were able to perform a ceremony and wish the best for their relatives in a culturally significant way. This photo was taken before the ceremony, of course, not during. Um, but it, it's, it's pretty special to be at these ceremonies and see how meaningful the process really is. Now that was a lot about how we actually do the reintroduction, um, how we actually do the translocations. Research is happening the whole time that we're doing that stuff too. So while we are trapping the foxes and doing their health inspections, we are taking measurements, um, we're taking blood samples and scat samples the whole time. And from those we're learning about the animal's stress level, nutrition status, there's a graduate student at George Mason University who's also st um, studying their behavior in addition to the stress and uh, nutrition levels. 
and figuring out if they have different personalities and if that correlates to their survival or movement once they're released. While they're being worked up by the state agency of veterinarians, they're collecting parasites, they're doing some disease sero-surveillance, so we're getting a lot of information from this effort. While the animals are trapped and handled, we're getting as much information as possible. And so far, it's been a lot of information. We've moved 103 foxes to date um, in these first three years. We've had a pretty even adult and juvenile ratio, pretty even numbers of um, animals that, were, that had already bred versus ones that were born that year. And we have a slightly male skewed sex ratio. And that wasn't intentional, that's just an artifact of what we caught last year. For some reason, we caught way more males than females, but so it goes. It's not too bad, it's not too far off. Um, and they've been, they've been released in six different areas, all on Fort Belknap so far. Okay, foxes are on the ground, then what? The answer to that question is we have so many more questions. Um, so we have questions that we want to know, um, that what matters for making this reintroduction a success? And so we're asking things like, is this population growing? Uh, where are they going? Where are they choosing to settle and disperse? What are they eating, and does that, or their stress, or their nutrition status change or make a difference to whether or not they reproduce or survive? So we've got a few key metrics that we measure in a few different field methods that we use to try to learn as much as possible once the animals are actually released. And it's mostly the use of GPS collars, picking up a whole lot of scat, and the use of camera traps. And so I'll move into each of those a little bit um, in a little bit more detail and share some of the results that we found so far. One of the quickest ways that we can feel good about whether or not this reintroduction is working is seeing whether or not they've reproduced. And luckily in the spring, swift foxes spend a decent amount of time above ground outside of their dens, making them detectable if we just drive around and look for them. <laughs> and I will tell you, it's a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's not easy. It's a lot of windshield time. You get your scopes and binoculars out and you strain your eyeballs. Uh, but you can sometimes get lucky and find them, count the number of kits, and get that spatial information about where they went. We can also use trail cameras um, to confirm whether foxes are in the area. And this is a photo of a couple of the Anya Nakoda College interns setting cameras and, you guessed it, picking up scat. Um, <laughs> but luckily, this um, maybe less than formal method of driving around looking for foxes has given us some really important information. This is a baby fox looking lovingly at its parents. Uh, <laughs> and what's cool about this, apart from it being so darn cute, is that uh, this is the first fox that was born on Fort Belknap in 51 years. Uh, this is the first time that we saw re reproduction. Um, we were able to see it the very first breeding season after foxes were moved up north. So that was pretty promising. And since the discovery of this little guy and his, his or her three siblings, um, we have since confirmed, I think, four total dens that we were able to put cameras in front of. And that resulted in uh, at least 20 kits that have been born up there so far that we've got photos of. And uh, we have reason to believe there's been more than that, too. Like I said, it's a needle in a haystack. We can't cover as much ground as we want to. Um, and there's been some different community reports and sightings of foxes in other areas. So that's one way that we can get an idea of whether the foxes are doing all right or not. Another way that we can get information on them is those GPS collars that I was telling you about. So every swift fox that's moved up to Fort Belknap is fitted with a GPS collar. You've probably seen it in some of the pictures so far. Uh, these things are appropriately tiny. Uh, they don't, the collars themselves don't weigh more than two ounces. Um, so it's very, very small. And because they're that small, we're kind of doing some trade-offs of their battery life. So these are giving us information on the foxes for about six to 10 months after they've been released. And how they work is, it's kind of cool. We're kind of pushing the boundaries of technology on this because they're really, really small. 
And uh, I can't be everywhere that the foxes go to track them, and neither can our field teams. And so one way that we're able to learn about them is through the use of this pretty cutting edge technology whereby the callers send the data that they collect three locations a night through the cellular network. And then those data are transmitted to a, um, a server to where every Sunday I get to see where the foxes have been. And it's kind of like Christmas. I'm always so curious where they've been. Uh, but we get the data once a week um, on Sundays and get to learn about their patterns and dispersal. We get information on whether or not they have died. And then as the season goes on after we've released them, it can help guide us on where to look for those swift fox dens. This is what those data look like. It's pretty meaningful, right? It definitely doesn't just look like a kid scribbled uh, with a few different colors of marker, right? Um, it does, it does. But if you look at it for long enough, some of the takeaways that you can get from looking at maps like this are, like I mentioned, knowing where they're going, knowing where they're settling, the black dots show their last location, and then the colorful lines are each different foxes. This is from the 2022 batch, so ones that we released in September. Uh, where they've been, what they've been up to, every GPS point along the way. And so looking at maps like this tells us a few different things. Um, one of my favorite takeaways from this is just the different strategies that are being adopted by different individuals. So some of them seem to be staying really, really tight, close together. So if it was a kid with a marker that's like a darker color that's gotten saturated as they scribbled back and forth. But some of the individuals take longer paths and seem to be exploring more. So this is exciting and something that we're going to continue to research, and I'll show you some of those results momentarily. But my preferred way to look at it is actually to see the movement data moving. Um, so I've got a video here. I'm going to orient you real quick. Um, this is the Fort Belknap boundary. We've got the Milk River here. And here's the Montana-Canada border. And I'm going to hit play. And you're going to see a bunch of different colored dots that then start moving. And so you'll see this mass exodus as they're released and start exploring their new habitat. And then I'll kind of narrate some more stuff as we go. All right, critters are being released. They're traveling. They're not all staying on tribal lands. They're not all staying south of the Milk River. Some of them crossed the brakes. <laughs> and things are pretty wild for the first couple months. But as we get into winter, things get a little bit calmer. You can see their home ranges kind of tighten up. And as one thing I should point out is that as these dots disappear, it doesn't necessarily mean the animal died. It might have, but it also could be the collar quit working. <laughs> but then, hold tight. One thing that we noticed from watching these actually move, <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> so as time is ticking down here, we saw that they had pretty tight home ranges during the winter. But then at the start of the breeding season, things got wild again. We saw... Um, and, and we know that swift foxes have a pre-breeding dispersal. They have this period of time in late winter and early spring where they start looking for a mate. But I definitely would not have predicted that those movements would have been exa as exaggerated as what we just saw. So that gives us even more questions. This is from the second group or the second year of releases. So, um, you know, it has us wondering, is that going to change over time? Are they going to keep having these wild movements? And what I can tell you about so far is that the movements are dampening. And that's kind of cool. So this is a bit of a busy graph. But just to let you know what's going on here, these are measurements um, of the total distance traveled. So if we played connect the dots with all those different GPS points and measured that trajectory and compared them across all the different foxes, some of the significant results that came out are shown here. We didn't see differences in sexes. And we didn't really see um, differences based on where we released the animals. But a couple things that we did learn is that juveniles are by and large moving shorter distances than the adults. And what I think is exciting is that by the third year of the reintroduction, the foxes were not moving as far. And so we're hopeful that what this means is that we have that better site fidelity. We're maybe approaching that critical density to where they don't have to look so far 
for good habitat and for mates. Now I've got one more map of the movement data that I wanted to talk about really quickly. You know, when we were watching that video, it's hard to not be kind of overwhelmed by how far some of those foxes can move, right? So this is showing the last known locations of all of our collars from the first three years of the reintroduction. And yeah, I mean, my eyes go to these ones. There's one that ended up by Great Falls. We've got some that prefer Canada. We have one that chose Fort Peck instead of Fort Belknap. Um, that's pretty wild, and the only way we know about that is from the use of these cellular GPS collars. I certainly would not have driven up that far to look for them. But what I think is more exciting about this map is just how many of the foxes have stayed close to Fort Belknap. This is really promising for their re reproduction and population growth. In fact, I've got it written up here, about 70% uh, of all the last known locations from all of our 103 foxes have been within 20 kilometers of Fort Belknap. So that's pretty exciting. And then the final note here, as I mentioned at the beginning, we thought for a long time that the Milk River was a pretty harsh barrier for that northern population. And these foxes are proving us wrong. Um, <laughs> not only do we have several with that last known location north of the Milk River, uh, we also have seen them go back and forth multiple times. So that's really exciting. That barrier might be more permeable than we thought, and maybe one of the elements leading to that is just the presence of other foxes. Maybe they were crossing it before but didn't have a reason to stay, and now they do. I hope that's what's going on, because that'd be really good for connectivity. But uh, more to learn. We're continuing to analyze these data. We've got a lot more to learn about those habitats that they're selecting, and so we'll be talking to, the, talking to you all about those results before long. The next thing I wanted to mention, though, is that I told you those GPS collars last for six to 10 months after release. And that's cool. We're getting sweet little animations out of it. Um, and we're learning a lot about that post-release dispersal. But it doesn't tell us about all the foxes whose collars have died. And it doesn't tell us much about the kits that have been born on Fort Belknap. So how are we going to learn about that? And how are we going to ever be able to answer that question of, well, how many foxes are there now? One thing that we didn't want to do is go out and retrap them. A lot of times when you want to count animals, you trap them, you mark them, you retrap them to estimate how many of them there actually are based on those ratios. And these translocated foxes have already been through some stress. We also know that they cover a lot of ground, so that might be difficult to catch up as many as we thought. So the strategy that we've taken to learn about swift fox density is a large-scale non-invasive survey. And so what that means is that each of these little black dots, there's about 300 of them, and we visit them to get information on the foxes without ever actually catching them. The final thing that I'll mention just about this slide here, this is from 2022, so I didn't go as many places as I planned. Uh, this is all done from October to December, and I could not go everywhere that I wanted from October to December last fall. <laughs> so it's not quite as many places as I intended to go, but you can see that we're sampling on tribal lands as well as the adjacent private and public lands because we do have foxes not necessarily respecting jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, but each of, those <laughs> each of those black dots has this little array going on for it. We have a remote camera, and about three meters from that, we have a scent post. And that scent post has some foul scent lure spread on the top of it. And then we also hammer in a can of cat food in front of that scent post to act as a longer term scent lure. It'll be stinky for a little while longer. And these foxes are not trained. They're not, but lucky for me, uh, in response to a novel scent, particularly at this time of year, foxes mark it by defecating. And so my team and I are able to go out and uh, we are glorified pooper scoopers from the months of October through December. And sometimes it's like right on target, man. They. Uh, <laughs> They're putting it exactly where we want it. So we go and we collect these samples, we label them, and without ever catching the fox, without ever touching it again, we send these samples to the genomics lab. 
they're able to get DNA extracted from it, and that tells us the individual, the sex, where it came from, and how it's related to other foxes. Um, and so that's pretty exciting. Uh, yeah, we're pretty excited about all the poops that we're picking up. <laughs> Uh, when we look at this on the map, um, just a few things that I want to point out here is that through the, these surveys, we have seen foxes on camera at 60 different locations, which is more than I thought. We have picked up over 150 swift fox scats so far, and as I'm talking to you tonight, the intern in Washington, D.C. is probably working on our DNA extractions from these. So we're pretty excited to find out just how many individuals we have from this effort. I do have a map on here just to point out. We don't have to go into any detail on this, but one of the things that's really exciting is to see where those last known caller locations are, which are in plus signs, and then all the areas that we've detected them on camera, which are the little round points. And what's really cool about this is that we're seeing these clusters of where the animals are choosing good habitat. And so it's nice to know that that site fidelity is happening and they're finding each other. The foxes are finding each other, following each other to good habitat. And we have found dens here and here. And we know of one here and a couple here. So their reproduction is already matching with what we're seeing on camera, which is pretty exciting. We also get some instant gratification from these photos in that uh, we get to see the foxes, which is always nice. They're usually pretty nocturnal, and I don't get to see them that much after we catch them. Uh, but the photos have given us some other cool information in that we're seeing foxes without collars on camera. And more than likely, these are foxes that were born on Fort Belknap. And we have photos of these uncollared foxes in seven different locations, uh, some of them like 10 or 15 kilometers away from where we knew we had a den. So this is even more reason to believe that they're reproducing in areas that we just don't know about. And so we cannot wait to get those genomics data back. All right, so the last research avenue, this one I have no results on yet. Uh, <laughs> but we are, let me tell you, we are getting everything we can from these scats that we're collecting. I told you before, we're getting the stress and nutrition levels. We're getting their genomics to find out how many individuals there are. And we're also using this DNA meta barcoding approach to figure out what they're eating and how that lends itself to their survival and overall success. And so we're doing some comparisons, um, both for all the swift fox scats that we collect, as well as all the coyote scats that we're picking up, because, oh, why would we only pick up swift fox scats when you can pick up all the canid scats that you find? Uh, we're going to be able to compare diet between swift fox and their main competitor. And then we're also setting out at every single one of those black dots that I showed you, where there's a camera and a scent post, we're also setting out these rodent track plates that by, it's this funny little shape that's got charcoal on either end, the mice walk through and they leave their tracks for us to identify and we'll be able to compare what the foxes are eating to what's available. And our hands get covered in charcoal. So now we smell like skunk lure and we look like coal miners. <laughs> so if you go to the Malta grocery store and you see me or smell me, you'll know why. Uh, but that just kind of leads me to wrap up with where we are right now and what's next. Um, we still have uh, our teammates with the Ani Nakoda College looking for dens right now, and they're going through some of the photo data that they've collected, so we're anxious to see what they find. Um, I might have mentioned this before, but our next batch of foxes is being moved up from Colorado this September, so we'll have a new batch to look at their GPS data pretty, pretty soon. And then yes, I will be smelling bad and covered in charcoal for three months as soon as those foxes are released and we look forward to what we're gonna learn from that effort. You've probably already picked up on, we've got a lot of analysis left to go. I mean, we're collecting data left and right and we're analyzing it as fast as we can, but uh, at some point I'm gonna need to sit in front of the computer and write it up. But even with just what I presented to you today, there are early results of this reintroduction that are very promising. Those metrics of reproduction, the animals reproducing in their first year, knowing that we have at least 20 kits and probably more is really exciting. Those different movement maps that I showed you and seeing just how many are staying close to home and especially that reduced movement rate over time is really promising. 
And then that, even just that takeaway of knowing that the Milk River might be more permeable than we thought and we might be closer to connectivity than we thought is something that's really exciting to know already. And we're just going to tease the rest apart. We're going to look at that habitat data, the diet data, all that other stuff I told you about to really learn a lot out of this. And so I've said it a few times, but this is a really big team effort. We could not do it without the support of the Fort Belknap Indian community, specifically the Ani Nakoda College and Fort Belknap Fish and Wildlife Department. And then you can see here just a sampling of the number of scientists from Clemson, George Mason, and the Smithsonian that are offering their expertise and resources to get this job done. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you all have. Thank you for listening to me. Yeah, good observation. Um, so we do usually put uh, two foxes per pin, and we decide who's paired together based on uh, where we captured them. So when we're in Wyoming, Colorado, we keep track of where each fox came from, and we try to pair it with an individual that was captured in that exact same location. So wh whenever possible, we're trying to keep their family groups together. Um, so we usually put one male and one female together, and like I mentioned, if we have reason to believe based on where we caught them that they're related, maybe siblings or a parent-child relationship, that's how we decide who to put together. Um, a little bit of both. So we have seen them cross. It's mostly been in the fall. We see it in the dead of winter, and then we've had a couple that have done it even in springtime. So I don't know if you might be suggesting that maybe they're crossing when it's iced over, but uh, they're doing it even when there's not ice. So I'm not sure what the deal is. One of the downsides is that, you know, we've got those GPS collars are collecting three locations per night, which seems like a lot of data. But when you're trying to connect the dots of just three locations per night, it doesn't quite give us that resolution to know exactly where they're crossing. Because I kind of wondered if maybe they're using bridges. We know that they travel on roads, so I don't know why they wouldn't use a bridge crossing as well. We have not. So we do build them pretty robustly, which might be why the interns hate it so much. Um, we put a lot of stakes in the ground, and we keep them pretty locked in tight. We have set cameras in front of those acclimation pins just to kind of learn more about what's going on. And we actually haven't had visitation by coyotes. We've had some cattle come in. And I've worried a little bit about what was going to happen there, but nothing too bad. And then another interesting thing has been, so I didn't really mention this, but we release them in batches. When we're doing this trapping effort, we tend to bring the foxes up every two to three days just so they don't have to be held too long. And so they'll get released in kind of a staggered fashion. And we have seen other swift foxes come that have already been released come to those acclimation pens presumably trying to dig towards their family member. And so that's been kind of interesting. Um, they were not able to get in, and I hope that we do not see any coyote depredation, but so far, so good. Yeah, that's a great question. So we did, we did. So all, um, every single fox that we've captured, we've collected blood from. So we have that really high quality DNA from every founder, um, and then we, you know, get our hands on every scat we can, and we're processing the DNA in those. So it's really exciting that we're going to end up having this um, whole, almost a pedigree of relatedness from the individuals that we know about at the time of trapping and how they've reproduced over time. In terms of livestock production and industry, I can't really think of one. So we're lucky that they are mostly eating things that a lot of the local landowners don't like that much anyway. Uh, they're taking out the rodents and grasshoppers. Uh, they're not, to my knowledge, a threat towards livestock operations. I wouldn't be surprised if they got into a chicken coop if everything was exactly right, but you just don't hear stories of it like you do those red foxes that are used to being um, near human settlements. So, um, in terms of negative impact of this one, I haven't heard too much. They are, prog they are set up to be biodegradable, the collars are, and I think it's based on where they latch. It's supposed to degrade after two years, is what I've heard, so we don't anticipate that the collars are going to be on a live fox for longer than two years. 
we were hoping we'd get data for longer than six to 10 months, I'll admit, so that's kind of what helped made that decision. Um, but uh, in terms of mortalities, we have learned about some where the fox died, and we learned about that from the collar data, and we are able to go into the field and pick those up at least as best as we can. Um, it's yeah, if finding the dens is like a needle in a haystack, I don't know what we would call looking for a collar about this small in the middle of the grassland, but we do it. And I think we've picked up, I guess, I would estimate somewhere between five and 10 collars from those events, and we're able to send them back to the collar company and get them refurbished and reuse them on the next batch of foxes, which is nice. So they are pretty nocturnal and for most of the year. They do all of their hunting, the, all of their foraging is happening at night. Um, and that's especially true in the fall and winter. Now on nice days, you can sometimes see them above ground. If the sun's out and the temperature's nice, they'll go lay out in the sun, but it's almost always right at the entrance of their den. So they're staying close to that escape cover. Um, they do become more diurnal in the springtime. Um, so you can see, like I mentioned, mom and dad are coming back to the den, feeding the pups, and you can see the pups above ground in the springtime pretty easily. Um, but by and large, most of their life is happening in the nighttime. Vocalization. Their vocalizations, oh man, that's a good question. Somebody studied uh, the long range barking distance of swift foxes as one of their graduate research projects, and it's been a long time since I read it. There's some people who think that they are using vocal communication. And I can tell you that when we trap them, there's a difference between some of the more docile and aggressive foxes and you hear it. They are doing growls and then you will also hear this kind of loud yip sound when they're upset about something. Um, in their everyday life, I don't know if I can answer that question, but when I make them mad, they're pretty loud. <laughs> You know, they will take what they can get. Um, the, it has happened, uh, but I do think across most of the diet studies that we've looked at, birds make up less than about 15% of their diet. So they're kind of opportunistic. I think when you're that small, you have to be. Uh, but by and large, it's rodents and insects. I will say, uh, especially when they're feeding all of those pups, they will definitely take what they can get. And we've found duck wings and curlew wings outside of den sites before, which is pretty interesting. They are, especially the, the areas that they're using as natal dens almost always have two or three entrances so that the mom and dad can escape as needed. Um, but whenever they're out foraging, they seem to have a map of other dens that they'll use, and those are more of the like single opening dens. But yeah, in terms of where they're raising their kids, it is complicated enough that they've got two or three openings. They can do either. Um, what we know about it is that they will expand the diameter of a prairie dog burrow so that they can fit into it a little better. But what we don't see is them reusing badger dens or coyote dens. So they'll make something larger, but they won't go into a den that's larger than what they need. You know, what we know about them at the time of year that we're seeing those really long distance movements is that they're either looking for their own habitat or they're looking for a mate. So their daily life, they're usually alone until that breeding season when they're with their partner. And then after that, uh, they're back to being alone again, unless they're raising kids. Now there's some people who have studied it and found that more related foxes will live in territories closer to each other. So the they have these little spatial neighborhoods, at least in Colorado is what they found through genetics, uh, which you know maybe if we think about it, that might mean they have to get into fewer fights about defending their territory boundaries or something. Um, but yeah, when we see those long distance movements, I don't think it's necessarily to inform others. I think it's either to find their own habitat and realistically finding the partner of the opposite sex. I don't know yet and I can't wait to find out. Um, I think that Seeing them go back and forth across the river is really exciting, and especially some of the ones that have chosen to stay there, and we've got GPS data suggesting that they're still alive and doing well. 
I hope that that means that they're mating and mixing. And we won't know if, they're, if the foxes from up north are coming down south until we get these genetic data back. So I can't wait to find out. I think it's happening, but I can't say for sure yet. Human-caused mortality does not seem to be as big of a deal now that all those poisons have been banned and are no longer being used in the way that they were. Um, swift foxes have a wide range of regulatory statuses across the different states and management agencies. Some of them treat them as just a non-game animal where no take is allowed, and other states do feel confident that they have good enough populations for harvest. So up in Montana, I think there's a couple of their different regions where the people are allowed to trap swift foxes, but it is regulated, and I think the quota is something like 10 animals. And once that, once that quota is reached, the trapping season ceases. So they're pretty well monitored, I think, and especially after the, the scare of them being potentially listed, the states are, are monitoring their populations and regulating take. They do tend to stay monogamous. They, they have that one litter, and they're only having one litter per year, but people have seen them return to the same mate year after year. And that's what we thought was the only strategy for a long time, because people were tracking them with radio collars and finding out that the same male and female were grouping together. So we're like, cool, this is a long-term monogamous species. That's really interesting. The genetics tell a different story. It's actually a little bit more like a soap opera. Um, there, are <laughs> there are some extra pair things happening when you look at the genetics, but socially, they are monogamous. I don't think so in terms of like looking at places that do have swift foxes and don't have swift foxes and comparing prairie dog dynamics. Uh, what I do know about the relationship between swift foxes and prairie dogs is that prairie dogs seem to be a more important diet item for them in some places than others. And so swift foxes are hanging out on prairie dog towns and having prairie dogs as more of their diet up here in the northern part of their range versus the southern part of their range for, for whatever reason. Um, I don't know about the numbers game overall, though. Prairie dogs can be hard to count. <laughs> <laughs> There's ways of doing it, but it, it's, it, it can be hard. Yeah, so when sylvatic plague comes through and takes out a prairie dog town, and if that's a place that swift foxes were living, it is going to have an effect on the swift fox populations. They've seen that in a couple different areas, like um, I know in Thunder Basin in Wyoming is a place that they, were, they had a big plague event and they're not seeing as many swift foxes anymore. But they do not die of the plague, as far as I know, at least not at the level that we tend to think about with prairie dogs and ferrets in a lot of our conversations. Um, they've picked up plague doing seroprevalence studies where foxes will be carrying around the antibodies for plague and still alive. So it has an effect, but mostly in terms of prey availability.